Okay, sure thing. Oh, it's officially official. Okay, awesome. Well, hi everyone, good evening. I think we're all in Pittsburgh, right? So I can say that um, I'm Stacy Hurt and uh, thank you for joining tonight, appreciate it. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. As Jen said, uh, we've been friends for a number of years. I adore Jen, she does so much for so many and um, I, I appreciate her more than I can say. And um, I'm just really honored to be with you. And uh, it is Colon Cancer Awareness Month. I'm wearing my blue. Um, the awareness color is blue. Some people think it's brown for poop. It is not. It is blue. And, um, you know, this program tonight and being with you is an important part of my advocacy work. And uh, I haven't taken, I've, I've never taken a dime. I'm sorry, was somebody saying something? No, I think it's okay. Okay. Um, let me go back here. I was starting uh, off. But uh, but anyhow, um, I've never taken a dime for any advocacy work they've done. Uh, patients have reached out to me and um, I'm just, I'm really proud. It's part of my, my purpose that we're going to be talking about tonight. It's part of my mission of giving back. And, uh, and yeah, like I said, it's super important to me. So um, before we get started, I do have to provide a disclaimer, and that is that um, all the views expressed tonight are my own. They do not represent my employer, who is Par Excel, who I'll talk about in a second. And anything that I, I lend tonight is not to be constituted for medical advice. And for that, I will refer you to your physician accordingly. So with that, let me go ahead and kick off. And so this is me about a million years ago. Note the blonde hair, but... Uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about me personally, and that is that uh, I have had a 25-year career in healthcare. You might see on my first slide, I have two master's degrees, a master's in health administration and an MBA, both from University of Pittsburgh. And um, I, I have a career in healthcare that spans across uh, physician practice management. I was in pharmaceutical sales. I carried the bag for 10 years for Mer Merck and GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, I headed up training and development for a pharmaceutical company, and I've been in various operational roles across healthcare. So, so that's most important is that I have a career in healthcare, and I've done a lot of different things in the business aspect of that. So along that career, I had two devastating diagnoses that I had to navigate. And so the first one was the diagnosis of my younger son, Emmett, in 2006, a year after he was born. Um, Emmett is one of three known cases in the world of his diagnosis, which is a 1Q duplication syndrome. So chromosome one is the largest chromosome in the body. And so he is globally affected. Emmett is 17 now. He's basically a 17 year old baby. He doesn't walk, talk, or do anything for himself in any way. Uh, he's incontinent. He wears a diaper. We have to lift him out of bed in the morning. We have to lift him onto the toilet, lift him off the floor, feed him, give him his medications. Um, he doesn't sleep through the night. Um, he doesn't sign or point. So to figure out what's wrong with him is just like through a process of elimination, like a baby. So um, me and my husband, who I'm married 24 years this year, um, are his primary caregivers. And we do have some nursing help, but uh, you know we're in the midst of a nursing crisis. So it's been really hard to keep help around. Um, but uh, it's this is a full-time job in itself, I will tell you. And, um, you know, I, I, I've told this story. I, I do a lot of speaking. I've told Emmett's story a thousand times. And every time I talk about Emmett, I get emotional because he's doing way more than the doctors ever expected. And even though he doesn't speak, he looks at me with uh, his big blue eyes. And, and I know that he knows how much he's loved. And so um, he's my whole world. <clears throat> so the second devastating diagnosis was myself in 2014. Um, and I can tell you that story. And that was with stage four colorectal cancer. So uh, what you should know about me is I'm a career athlete. I played volleyball and basketball in high school at Norwin High School. We were state champions. I've, I've always been a fit, healthy person. I'm a non-smoker. 
And so in 2014, uh, I started having symptoms of uh, blood in my stool, uh, cramping, pain. And it finally just got, I sort of ignored it because I was busy and I was busy with Emmett. I was traveling for my job and then the pain got really intense. So I went to my doctor and she's like, this is probably internal hemorrhoids. I'm going to send you for a colonoscopy and we'll go from there. And I was like, all right. And they woke me up from my colonoscopy and I heard the words that we've all heard. And that is you have cancer. And I just was like, I, I don't even know how can that even be? I take good care of myself. I do everything right. I have no family history. And they were like, the GI was just like, it just happens. And I, I was like pissed. I was like, I, I don't even, how could that even be? I, I was really mad, <laughs> still mad. And, um, and then I went, you know, for a series of tests and um, the PET scan revealed cancer in 27 places in my body. So I had an 11 centimeter tumor in my rectum. It was in my liver. It was in my lungs and it was in my lymph nodes. And I went to see Nathan Bahari down at Hillman. I think he's since left there. Um, and he gave me the results of my PET scan. And I said, well, what are my chances? And he's like, well, I don't have a crystal ball. So, and I'm like, okay, he's not even telling me what my chances are. Like, that's bad. Like I am going to die, but I refused to accept that. So I just said to him, I'm like, and he's like, well, this kind of just depends on you. And I'm like, well, if this depends on me, then I'm going to tell you, I'm going to kick cancer's ass. And he's like, well, that's what I wanted to hear. Now, meanwhile, I'm like, still like, I'm going to die. I, I have no idea. And as a matter of fact, I walked out of his office and passed out, like went straight. And I am not a passer outer. And I went straight down apparently and fainted, um, mostly from lack of food. Cause you're going through all these tests and like, you're not eating and you're not sleeping. Cause you think you're going to die. So, um, but I fainted and, um, came to, and basically I, uh, went to work. I had to start chemotherapy after I got my port in and, in a nutshell, I did 55 chemotherapies. I did, um, I had two surgeries. It was supposed to be one for my resection and he um, nicked a blood vessel. I internally bled. I went into cardiac arrest and almost died, coded, almost died, woke up in the ICU. I'm still alive, did more chemo, um, cyber knife radiation in my lungs. And the good news is that I am seven years cancer-free. So Everybody like, we can pause for applause. Everybody loves that part. I still love that part. I'm really excited about that. And um, yeah, and onward and upward. Um, so uh, I, you know, I'm a big proponent of survivorship. Um, I'm still closely monitored. You know, we all know what this is right here. And that's me going in for, I still get PET scans. Uh, my oncologist is really protective of me. Um, the CT scan, missed my liver. So I get approved for pets. Everybody's like, how do you get pets? And I'm like, the CT missed my liver. Um, so yeah, I still, I, I I'm up to once a year now. Uh, but I was diagnosed on my 44th birthday. So birthdays have a new meaning for me. Um, and I'm 52 now and everyone is a gift. Everyone is a gift. So Stacy, where are you now? What do you do now? So, um, I decided to turn my mess into my message. And um, I really got into patient advocacy work. Uh, there's a lot of colon cancer online support groups. And because I worked in healthcare and because I advocated for Emmett, there was a lot of questions like, how do you file an insurance appeal? How do you talk to doctors? And I was always chiming in like, you do this, you do that. And they were all like, oh, Stacy's like some sort of an expert. And um, so I, I sort of like kind of got regar regarded as an expert in the advocacy groups. And, and that just like sort of grew. I volunteered for nine different advocacy organizations while I was sick. And, um, I, you know, it just, I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I'm crazy. I think I'm on a mission. Um, but this is my friend, Jim, who sadly is no longer with us, but Jim was my cancer husband. And, um, we became very close. It came very close with his family and we did a fundraiser in his name. And, um, I know he's my guardian angel looking after me. Um, yeah, and um, like I said, just continued advocacy. This was for fight colorectal cancer. And then I also forged um, an advocacy, a, a um, speaking career. I do motivational speaking, inspirational speaking. 
as well as I started a consulting business because I saw a huge gap between those people who work in healthcare and those of us that receive healthcare. And I didn't realize how big the gap was till I was on both sides and I saw the need. There was a problem to solve um, of understanding. Um, so I started that consulting business in 2019, 2018, 2019. I was going to launch it full scale in 2020, COVID hit, but I still had a lot of virtual opportunities. And um, a company called Par Excel saw me speak at a conference and they um, liked what I was about and offered me a position. And I, I it was a contract starting in May and it just became full time in February. So that's another thing I'm pretty excited about. But um, it's in patient engagement. And Par Excel um, runs clinical trials for pharmaceutical companies. So when a pharmaceutical company wants to commercialize a compound to make it into a drug, they would hire a company like Par Excel to set up and run the clinical trials for them. And what I do is I speak for the needs of patients and caregivers in the trials. So if they need travel, extra support, um, child care, whatever it's going to take to keep those patients and caregivers in that trial, I fight for us. So, uh, so um, that's a little bit about me personally and professionally. Um, what I want to say about this presentation is that I'm just going to plant some seeds of stuff that I did that worked for me, but I want this to be interactive. So as I'm going through things, I just want to plant like thought seeds, and then we're going to come back at the end, and I, I want us to talk and. And I, I can't do two things at once, so I can't monitor the chat. But if you have any questions, pop them into the chat. We'll get to them at the end. And we're just going to like talk like human beings um, and uh, talk about our, our purpose through cancer. So like I said, I, I'm asked a lot, how did you do it, Stacey? And I, I'm not really sure. I'm be honest. I drink a ton of coffee. Um, I laugh a lot. <laughs> I laugh at myself a lot. Um, but, um, but here's some of my keys. So um, when I was started to be asked a lot about like, how did you do this? Um, I came up with like a little acronym and I was like, does cancer make you feel antsy? And it really became like my five keys to surviving and thriving. And like I said, we're just going to have an open conversation. And, and the, the, the one thing I want to say about me is that I'm like sandals. I'm all inclusive. <laughs> so, uh, so. I'm going to talk about um, my faith a little bit. I live with two atheists. Um, so, you know, whatever works for you, you want to pray, you want to vibe, you want to dance, you want to light candles, whatever works for you, we are sandals. And believe me, right, right now, it's March and Pit. wish we were all at sandals. Can't live with that, but close enough. So um, here's my little face um, <laughs> being a survivor. And uh, again, I can't really, I can sum it up in three things. I mean, and, and again, I'm talking, I'm preaching the choir here, but I mean, you got to be mentally tough. You got to be physically tough and you have to be emotionally authentic and you got to be vulnerable and you got to be available. I hate the toxic positivity. Oh yeah, that's another thing. I'm going to give you a lot of just my opinions, take them for what they're worth. That and a dollar will get you, you know, bazooka piece of bubble gum. But, I, you know, oh, be positive. Be, I, I don't subscribe to that. I just say, be authentic, available, and vulnerable. When you're feeling good, tell people you're feeling good. When you're not feeling good, Tell people you feel like shit. Oh, I may swear to, sorry. Um, but that's that's really it in a nutshell. So to boil it down, the A stands for attitude. Um, like I said, about being tough. Um, I used some visualization. Um, I, and, and some of this is going to be hokey. I'm going to warn you. But I would visualize the cancer leaving my body. Um, I would visualize a healthy, vibrant self, even on my sickest days. And I was super sick, um, but I would visualize a healthy individual. Uh, thought replacement therapy, it's a whole psychology I read up on um, of every time a negative thought would come in, like I'm going to die, I would actively replace it and push it out with the opposite of I am going to live. Um, 
And it really worked for me because I had to get out of that dark place. Like I was like really in that dark place and I, I had to get out of there. So I had to like talk myself out of it. Um, like I said, I laugh a lot. I laugh at myself. I'm going to tell you a story. I hope nobody's eating. But uh, when I had my surgery down at Shady Side, my big surgery, um, they were like, you, you can go home when you poop, you know, when you go to the bathroom. And I was really backed up be because of the resection and everything. And my husband was with me. And I'm just like, gosh, I hope, you know, hope I can go. I hope I can go so I can go home. And I was sitting in the chair, like next to my hospital bed. And all of a sudden, it was like a river of poop started coming out of me. Like it was next to me. It was like dripping off the chair. It was on the floor. And I was like, oh my gosh. I was like humiliated and everything. And I was like, oh my gosh. And my husband just starts laughing at me. And he's just, he's literally like, like laughing at me. And I'm like, shut up. I hate you. And, um, so he called the, the um, attendant from the floor and he came in and I just was sitting there and I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And he was like, oh no, honey, this is great. This means you're going home. I deal with this all day, every day. Don't worry about it. I'm just happy for you. <laughs> I was just like mortified, but um, stuff like that. That's a real true story that happened. Um, and then I get to pivot from that right into, I pray every night, right? So. Um, I've said the same prayer every night since I was diagnosed. And of course, you can see about me, I made it up myself. And it is thank, ask, pray, praise. I thank God for the day I've had, even when I'm feeling my worst. I ask him for complete and total healing of my body. I pray for somebody else in need. I just, I'm thinking about a lot of people I'm praying for right now. I'm sorry. And then I praise his great name for all the beauty around us. They thank, ask, pray, praise. Maybe it'll work for you. Um, another thing I do is um, I subscribe to the Integrative Oncology Program down at uh, UPMC. That's where I was treated. And um, we worked a lot on nutrition. You know, there's a lot of controversy around the sugar thing. And I'm not, you know, um, you know, does sugar cause cancer? Does it not? I, I personally have only seen data around uh, brain cancer because of how quickly the cells divide in the brain. Um, but I chose myself to switch to a plant-based high protein, low sugar, low dairy, low sodium, no processed meats, the important one here for colon cancer people can't, that's, that's a big no-go, but the rest of it was really pretty much, um, how I, what I chose to do just because I wanted to make my body into a lean, mean cancer fighting machine. And, um, to do that, I had to be really locked in on nutrition. I worked with a dietitian at my um, cancer center. She was wonderful. Um, I looked at supplements. I had to ask to get my vitamin D checked. It was really low. I, I read about the link to low vitamin D to cancer, um, how cancer goes after calcium. I started a calcium supplement. Again, these were all in conjunction with my uh, uh, advice from my oncologist. Um, other things. I take Xanax every night to this day. I am not afraid to tell you that, um, you know, I struggle with mental health and anxiety and depression, the roller coaster of cancer, ups and downs. Um, I do move a lot. I, I'm glad to hear you guys are, I say guys inclusively, all of you are uh, moving. I started my own campaign about March to Health. I put on some pounds over the holidays, eating too much crap. <laughs> I'm afraid to tell you, I got to take it off. And um, I did a lot of yoga on my more ill days just to keep the movement going. Um, and I did massage. I had to give up acupuncture when I started Avastin because I was a bleeding risk. And I did Reiki too. Um, it was all part of the, the IO program. Um, nutrition is also nutrition of the mind. And these were some of the things that I did. Um, you know, journaling is great to get your thoughts and feelings out, blogging, um, decluttering gave me a nice sense of control, um, of, you know, making a nice organized space for my healing. Um, you can, I, I won't, I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist. I'll let you read up on cognitive behavior therapy, but music therapy, art therapy, and meditation were, were keys in my healing. Um, I, I derived great joy from, um, the adult coloring books and, um, music therapy and meditation. Um, it worked for me. 
Um, the T is for treatment. Um, I, like I said, I do a lot of advocacy work and, and, you know, people ask me kind of like these keys in treatment. And, and this is, again, this is my two cents. Uh, you got to have a good plan. You have to have a plan that you can follow. You can have the best plan in the world, but if it's not going to work for you, you're not going to do it. And um, so when you get a plan, talk back to your doctor and say, if you have questions, ask the questions. If you don't think you can do something, tell him, her, or they that you can't do it. Um, so you have to be on board with your plan. You have to be on board with your oncologist. If you don't like your oncologist, fire them, get a new one because your oncologist should be your biggest cheerleader. Um, get a second opinion at a large academic medical center. Um, if, if you do have, if you are metastatic, uh, if you're being treated at a community center, I do recommend being seen at a large NCI cancer center. Um, people talk, you know, uh, about the new normal. When I say new normal, I have tons of things wrong with me and my survivorship. I can't go to the bathroom the right way. I did not have an ostomy. I was really lucky, but I have what's called lower anterior resection syndrome that nobody told me about. I had to find it through an advocacy group, but I have bouts of um, diarrhea and constipation, also clustering, which means I have to go to the bath. Um, the, the waste doesn't come out all at once because I have a kinked rectum. So I have to go back and forth to the bathroom a lot. And it's just my new normal. I have neurop I have permanent neuropathy in my hands and my feet. Um, and we just, you know, we as cancer survivors develop workarounds, you know, and I say cancer survivor, we have survivors in treatment with us tonight. We have long-term survivors and uh, the American Cancer Society defines a survivor from the day you're diagnosed. So we're all survivors on some continuum of that. Um, clinical trials, if they're appropriate, um, you know, bring them up to your doctor. You, Unfortunately, we need to be having those conversations proactively with our oncologists. Are there clinical trials available? Are there different options available? Have those conversations. And I say take the drugs because I have a lot of patients I work with that are like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to take Ativan. I want to take the drugs. Don't be a hero. <laughs> take the drugs. Science is our friend. Um, so, you know, but these things kind of all work together. Um, support, um, you know, I, I was really lucky in that I had a big support system and your support system is kind of what you, what you make of it. Um, whether that is an in-person support group, um, whether that's a hybrid or virtual support group, but I tell people just do try not to go through this alone, try to get some sort of support to lean on and, and whatever that looks like for you, if that's your family, if that's your friends, if that's your friends who are your family. Um, you know, uh, for me, my inner circle was really, you know, my gut check. And, and I, I do do a lot on social media and, and um, but I had a really tight inner circle of people who knew the information when I knew it and were there to support me no matter what. Um, and then uh, I, I put on here financial counselors. There's financial toxicity of cancer is real. Um, I I was very blessed. I mean that I had the resources, but I'm very I work with tons of patients who do not, and and there's a lot of things out there um, to help financially. So, and the why in ANSI is for you. And that is, you know, I think what we're here to talk about tonight. Um, cancer stole my, I know, a healthcare executive. Um, I was just kind of getting Emmett's uh, care on track. I was really doing my dream job, um, head of training and development for a drug company. And cancer completely stole my identity. I have had to reconstruct my identity from scratch. Um, I lost a lot of friends. I don't speak to some members of my family. Um, that's the reality. And I've gone through therapy and I, I'm still in therapy and working to make myself the best version of myself that I can be. Um, I'm not perfect. I'm a work in progress, but I'm really proud of the person that I am now. And I have no regrets. 
um, for what I've been through and, and, and what I've said and what I've done. Um, we have the saying in the community, you know, don't let cancer confine you or define you. Um, and I know that in talking to my oncologist who I was seen by Vince Reyes, who he's, I can't say enough good things about Vince, but, you know, he said to just keep everything in balance. I remember he told me my first day of chemo, he said, he said, uh, three keys of chemo. He said, whatever you're doing now, keep doing it. He's like, tell me something you enjoy. And I said, at the time it was coaching my son's volleyball team. He said, keep doing it. So I remember I had a pump on, you know, I still have my port by the way, eight years later, and I had a pump with poison going into my port and I was out there running drills at volleyball. And I, again, I don't know how I did it. <laughs> it was important to me. It was important to, to me being me. Um, and he said, don't start any, the second rule was don't start anything new. He's like, what's something you're thinking about doing? And I said, well, I'd really like to run a 5k. And he's like, are you a runner now? And I said, no, he said, yeah, don't start. I was like, good advice. I'm still not running. Um, but it was, you know, yeah, if you're not, he's like, you know, don't start anything new. So his, his advice there was to maintain balance. And then his third uh, um, key of chemo, key of cancer was to stay infection free. And that was when people came into your house, make them take off their shoes, make them wash their hands, um, avoid close contact with the hugs and everything. And I think, I mean, I, I went through, you know, treatment pre COVID. I think if there's anything that COVID taught us, um, it was to be keen on infection. And so, um, that, that advice really voted me well, I, I must say. Um, and then, um, when you can, paid forward. I know some of us in the audience, you know, we're fighting for our lives and I get that. Um, but a smile, a word of encouragement to each other in this group, um, to others that you encounter who've been touched by cancer, affected by cancer, boy, it can go a long way. And I had no idea how much my words impacted others until I started doing this. And, uh, I'm really grateful. I'm really grateful. So um, just a word about my work. I wanted to share some things with you that may be encouraging no matter where you are on the, the patient journey. Um, I have waited about 20 years for this because the whole time I was doing my work, I was like, nobody's listening to patients. Like nobody cares what the patients think. And finally, um, what happened in COVID um, is that we saw that the vaccine trials left out a lot of patients of color and different abilities. Um, and so uh, what happened with the vaccines were that they were not adopted by these underserved communities. And the FDA came forward with what was called um, guidance on patient-focused drug development. And it's now a mandate in phase three clinical trials to have a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan before they go forward. Um, so this is the whole remit of my role and what I do, and that's ensuring that the patient voice is heard in drug development. So I just want all of you to know I am fighting for us. It's like super important to me. And, and then I blow people up on Twitter, which is awesome. Um, so like I put stuff out like this because, and I'm not afraid I can share this because I shared it with Dr. Reyes. And that is when at St. Clair, they, they designed the new um, Dunlap outpatient center. Dr. Reyes was um, keen. He was very um, acutely involved in that design. And there were some things that weren't really patient focused. And I said to him, I said, um, you know, when you were asking the patients how to design the center, why didn't you ask me knowing the work I did? And he basically said they didn't ask any patients, um, which is a big miss. Um, and like I said, I had a conversation with them, so I'm not speaking out of school. But my point is you can't talk about the patient experience without asking patients. Hello, we are here to help. And that's that whole pay it forward message. Um, so final thoughts are you know, just stay in your lane. This is, you know, your journey, your fight, your battle, however you want to refer to it. Don't compare it to anybody else. 
don't look back. I, I have, you know, a lot of like, oh, if only I would have gone sooner, you know, there's no change in the past. Don't look back, just look forward. Um, fully commit something that I was telling Jen when we were prepping for the session was that, you know, I didn't know if I was going to live or die, but I said, I'm going to give it all I got. And I am, I am, no, I am going down, go knowing that I gave this everything that I could. And that was just what was important to me. Um, I didn't want to leave anything on the table. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm the luckiest person going to be alive. Believe me, I know that. And, um, but I definitely gave it everything. Um, you know, I, like I said, I got people I don't talk to set those boundaries. It's okay to say no to social things. You're not feeling well, say no. You know, if somebody, you know, says something the wrong way, just tell them no. Um, and just control the things that you can control. Um, and, and that's the best that you can do. Just, we're all doing the best that we can. And that is enough. That is enough. So with that, this is my family Aww. so much. Yeah. And my older son's a freshman at Pitt. His name's Griffin. Um, and you see Emmett and that's my awesome husband, supportive husband, Drew. Um, and that's it. So, um, all right, enough, Stacy. let me take this off. Um,